for the former things have passed away. Amen. So, amen. Speaking of catechisms, oh, it is the last week of the month. So, we'll be moving around a bit. If you want to be able to follow along and bounce with me as I move through the passages, they're listed in the bulletin. in the fact that I'm not a radio personality anymore and there can be dead air. <laughs> Alright. A little coffee. Last time. The last time in the Catechism I had explained that there are four states of man concerning sin. The first state was that of Adam and Eve in the garden. Able to sin, able not to sin. The second state of mankind is us after the fall. Not able to not to sin. The third is the state of redeemed man, saved by Christ and dwelt by the Spirit, able not to sin. And the fourth was actually in that question. The fourth is the glorified man, in heaven, in the new city, unable to sin, not able to ever sin again. Again, I guess I'll spare you guys the Latin labels, although it would be fun to quiz you on them a little bit. But concerning mankind, there are only these four states, these four ways of man concerning sin. And it's the second one that I speak of again today as we look at the Catechism. <clears throat> the state of fallen man is that he is not able not to sin. And whose fault is that? To whom does the blame lay? Even though we can trace the sinful condition of the fall to Adam, who is to blame for your sin? You are. I bear the blame for my sin. We don't get to pass the buck on this. That is the bad news. I'm a sinner, and I deserve justice and wrath. Yet even as we study the blackness of sin, and the bad news, we have to always consider, always declare the remedy of sin, which is the cross. It's the good news. So I will speak much of sin this morning, due to the nature of the question, but we will also speak of sin's cure. Now, concerning the Catechism. The Catechism before us teaches biblical truth in an orderly way. The orderly way is by question and answer format. Now the word may sound a little weird, but the word catechism finds its roots in the New Testament when Paul and others refer to instruction, biblical instruction here. Now some sermons are action-oriented, practical in the immediate setting. The text itself often commands us to act in specific ways in pursuit of godliness and holiness. Other times when we are together, it is very doctrinal, foundational and teaching us the content of our faith, what we are obligated to believe. This is also very practical. But for us, the practicality may not be immediate, but it is long-term. The practicality of studying these things is a foundation of right belief that leads to right action. And our faith requires both, right belief and right action. So this morning we join together and we will learn right belief according to the very words, the very decrees of our God, as we look at this 22nd question. <clears throat> what is the sinfulness of that condition, sin and misery, into which all mankind is fallen? The sinfulness of the condition into which all mankind fell is the guilt of Adam's first sin, the lack of original righteousness, and the corruption of of our whole nature, which is commonly called original sin, together with all actual transgressions which come from this nature. Scriptures being Romans, will be in Romans 5, Romans 3, Ephesians 2, Isaiah 53, Psalm 51, Matthew 15. One of these days we're going to do this like Bible girl. <laughs> 
Romans 5.19 <clears throat> For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Romans 3.10 As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. Ephesians 2 And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Psalm 51, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Matthew 15, for out of the heart come evil thoughts. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. We'll consider the guilt of Adam's first sin in relation to the question and answer. Romans 5.19. We've been here several times. This is a critical verse as we move through the nature of our sin. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Again, we cover this passage several times. Here, Paul reminds you that in Adam's fall, we sin all. That used to be a uh, way to teach children about their sin nature once upon a time. In Adam's fall, we sin all. And this is the teaching of the imputation of sin. What that means. Adam's fall means that humanity, everyone descended from him, including you, we are all born with a sinful nature. We are set in the mold of Adam's transgressions. That imputation of sin is a difficult doctrine. We want to believe that everybody's good. That actually is part of our sinful nature to make that assumption. The imputation is a difficult doctrine, but it's important because it is the bad news. We start with the bad news, but it balances with the next portion of the verse. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Just as Adam's sin nature is imputed to every single one of his descendants, Christ's righteousness is imputed to all who receive him. Christ's obedience and not yours. Christ's righteousness and not the filthy rags that we would drape ourselves in. It's applied to our account. It is counted to us. And that is the good news of Jesus. Christ. And we must always declare the good news when the bad news is addressed. What do we do with this as we move through the catechism? Adam's race is a fallen race. All of Adam kind. This is part of why Genesis in a literal six day creation and a literal Adam and a literal Eve are doctrinal issues that are very important. We don't give here. Because if we give here, Romans 5 doesn't apply. The literal Adam sinned. He fell. He died spiritually that very moment in the garden. And through him, through that literal Adam, literal sin, every literal descendant were born in a state of sin. Except Only one. Because of a literal Adam and a fallen race of mankind, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, delivers many from spiritual death into eternal life. And this means that you inherited Adam's curse. It is your birthright. Your inheritance. And in Christ, you're adopted as a son, and you inherit his righteousness. This is the 
natural state of man. Don't be surprised either when one of Adam's race acts sinful and acts fallen. That's why wouldn't they? We are born sinful, we are born guilty, and as the question and answer tells us, we have a lack of original righteousness. Romans 3, Ephesians 2, Isaiah 53. Romans 3, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. While each person is born with a sin nature, they live wicked lives of their own accord. No one, including you or me, no one except Jesus Christ has any righteousness of your own. You don't possess any that is internal to you, that is not imputed to you from Christ. We have never earned, we will never earn, we can never earn the salvation that God freely offers in Jesus Christ alone. Paul doubles down in Ephesians. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead men are not alive. And that is a silly thing to say. But it's essential. Dead men aren't alive. Dead men act like dead men. There's no spark of goodness in anyone. There's nothing spiritually alive in the dead man. Your own personal sins, and by that Paul is referring to sinning in thought, in word, or in deed, and trespasses, and these are violations of God's commands, these are proof that apart from God granting you eternal life, you are dead. You're spiritually dead. And this is not something unique to Paul. Isaiah says it too, many, many years before Paul said it. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 6. Sheep are big, dumb, smelly animals. I know we see them in pictures and all bright, white, and cute, and lamby. Um, Isaiah was familiar with sheep. And he includes himself with all of the rest of Adam's race. All of us including you, we're not just big, dumb, smelly animals. We're straying, wandering off big, dumb, smelly animals. All of us have preferred to turn from God's way and chase our own spiritually dead ways. And only the one that Isaiah refers to here never strayed. Again, Jesus Christ. And on Christ, God laid upon him the suffering that we deserve for the sins, the trespasses, the many iniquities. What do we do with this? Each member of Adam's race is born spiritually dead. We're spiritual stillborns. This is not a favorite doctrine for many. Uh, it's true, but it's, it's a hard thing. This is not a warm and fuzzy biblical truth. But like every biblical doctrine, it is true. Absolutely true. That apart from Christ, everyone is dead. All men are dead men. Apart from Christ, there is no righteousness. Apart from Christ, there is only wickedness. There is only sin. There's only trespass. And even if we can't see it because it looks kind of okay, that just proves that our eyes are spiritually dead as the rest of us. Apart from Christ, apart from the good shepherd, 
who lays down his life for the sheep. The sheep are lost, and they love their own way. But our shepherd paid a price for his sheep. The Lord himself laid upon God the Son our iniquity. We lack all righteousness in ourselves, and there is a corruption of our whole nature. David, Psalm 51. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. David wrote this psalm to confess and repent of his sin. David wrote this psalm to be sung out loud by others as he commemorates his sin and his repentance. He makes no excuses for himself. David rightly claims that he was full of iniquity from birth. He isn't actually commenting on his mother's sinfulness, although like all of Adam's race, she's also sinful. He speaks of the sinful nature that was his possession from his beginning. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Now again, this is not David calling his mother sinful, though indeed she was. The point is, is that at conception, David possessed a fallen inheritance that traces back to the very first man. So do you, and so do I. What do we do with this? Adam's race is entirely sinful from birth. Now, this does not mean that before Christ, before you knew him, you never did anything of any earthly value. <clears throat> but everything you did was in rebellion against God because he was not in his rightful place. And because of that, even the good that men appear to do has zero eternal value. At the very core, each of us, apart from Christ, is entirely corrupt, entirely dead in sin, entirely without merit, wholly given to a sin nature from the moment of our conception. There is a corruption of our whole nature, and from that we commit actual transgressions. Matthew 15. For out of the heart come evil thoughts. Jesus was teaching where sin and impurity originate. <clears throat> impurity doesn't come from outside yourself. Your impurity and sin are a fountain within you. A fountain within your heart. And heart doesn't mean just an emotional thing. This is intellect, emotion, and will, the way the Hebrews refer to the heart. And this is your heritage. It comes from Adam, but each person commits their own sins. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Now, looking at that verse, we have to be careful to avoid the pharisaical attitude. We dare not thank God that I am not like other men. Because I haven't committed any of the really bad sins. Remember, the sins I commit are understandable and they're small. The sins you all commit are terrible. That's the pharisaical attitude. Here, murder is placed in the same list as slander. False witness same line as adultery. Now, there may be a hierarchy of sins as it pertains to certain earthly consequences. In our day, a murderer will likely see prison uh, or perhaps lethal injection. And at the same time, all sorts of sexual immorality have become commonplace, a source of entertainment, and opened up the Olympics. The point is that the human heart is a dark place. Stone. But this dark stone gives birth to all sorts of sin. Don't compare your heart to a murderer's. If you want to compare your heart, 
compared to Christ's. What do we do with that? In Adam's race, Eve's descendant is guilty of their own sin. Don't pass the buck only to Adam. Each of us, guilty of personal transgressions on our own accord. And while we might feel pretty good about ourselves if we only focus on the big sins, or sins that we've never had to struggle with, when we compare our heart to Christ's heart, we quickly see the difference. We see that sin wells up within us. But, while our natural fallen state is not able not to sin, in Christ, because of Christ, the regenerated child of God, that dark stone is removed. And we are given a new heart. And we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So that, Christian, you, by the power of God in you, you are able not to sin. Now what? Bringing it all together. You guys can mosey this way, kind of, sort of. We're going to have a closing song today. Question 22. What is the sinfulness of that condition, sin and misery, into which all mankind has fallen? The sinfulness of the condition into which all mankind fell is the guilt of Adam's first sin, the lack of original righteousness, and the corruption of our whole nature, which is commonly called original sin, together with all actual transgressions which come from this nature. So concerning unbelievers, those who have not responded to the good news, fallen, sinful men act like fallen, sinful men. Stop being surprised that the lost act in agreement with their own nature. It's not a surprise. It shouldn't be a shock. A pray for compassion. They're dead. Pray for boldness. God can command dead men to live. And in that boldness, proclaim the good news. Remember, Christ is still making dead men alive. I'm concerning one another as we live this Christian life together. Be surprised, but not too surprised, when regenerated men act like fallen sinful men. In Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are able not to sin. But as long as we possess this fallen fleshly body, we still sin. Hold one another accountable. And pray for brotherly love to conduct yourself in godliness to one another. Overlook what can be overlooked. And seek brotherly discipline for what must be addressed. <clears throat> Concerning you, I hope you're not at all surprised that you still sin. Until heaven, we don't hit that fourth state, that blessed state, not able to sin. Wow. I hope you look forward to it. But in the meantime, we don't give ourselves a free pass. Hold yourself accountable before anybody else has to. Repent of sin quickly. Don't dally and Risk the discipline of God. It will be in love, but it's going to hurt. Repent of sin quickly. Seek forgiveness from one another as necessary. Don't withhold forgiveness. If this is a problem, pray for grace and mercy from the one who has forgiven you. And then forgive like he does. And don't forget the good news. Don't dare forget the good news 
when we have to consider the bad news. Yes, the bad news is that all men are sinners. Everybody is born dead in sin. Everybody deserves God's wrath and punishment. The good news. The good news is that Christ, that in Christ, man is forgiven of sin is given a new heart, is wrapped and clothed in Christ's own personal righteousness, that in Christ we do possess eternal life right now. Indwelt by the Spirit, the Christian, though, you Christian, you will grow in holiness. Because of Christ's work on the cross, the child of God will one day be free from sin and free to worship and adore God in heaven forever. Let's keep working toward that even now. And in this, may you be burdened for the sinful condition of dead men that surround you. And may you be blessed whenever and wherever you proclaim the light and light of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, now the words of the song are just going to hopefully just get home on the back so it's all standing. Completely known, completely loved. <laughs> Son, when he 
Peter 1, 1 through 2. To those who have been chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in abundance. God's people said, Amen. Amen. 